Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming and confronting the uh, grouchy premonitions of your Waze app <laughs> to join us on this Friday afternoon. Um, I want to, I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists as we go along so it doesn't all blur together, but I want to remind you all why I'm sitting here. I'm the vice president of Creative Armenia, which is a global arts foundation with a mandate to reconstruct a forgotten culture by discovering talent, developing it, and ultimately investing in and producing it across the arts. Um, my name's Alec Mohibian, and I also want to report my personal and Garin Hovhannisian's personal thrill in being partners with the Skoll Center at, and the Promise Institute of UCLA. We have ancestral connections to this institution and our, are also uh, season ticket holders of two of its ball-playing teams. <laughs> so it's really a dream come true. Thank you to uh, Chancellor Block for coming here and for hiring Chip Kelly. And uh, we will move on and come back to all that good Bruin stuff. Um, so our first panelist, we're going to begin with the immediate present, Evgeny Afanevsky. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Great. Um, Evgeny began his career directing musicals in Israel, and he has recently created two extremely powerful documentaries, most recently Cries from Syria, which is on HBO, and <laughs> good people have seen it, I'm glad. And before that, uh, Winter on Fire, which is on Netflix, about the Ukrainian Euromaidan revolution, an absolute must-see as well. Um, <laughs> We can talk forever about both of these films, but I want to start the panel by showing a clip from Cries from Syria, a short clip, which I hope is a counterpoint to anyone who thinks the title of this panel is grandiose. Let's show the clip, please, my friends, in the booth of Cries from Syria. Cries from Syria. So Evgeny, you described your mission in Cries from Syria to tell the comprehensive story of the Syrian war. What is the comprehensive story you were trying to tell? I think as a filmmaker and as a storyteller, uh, you want to tell the story from the beginning and uh, till the end. When I finished Winch on Fire, I bumped into the refugee crisis in European Union. And I realized that for me and for the European Union, people don't know much about the refugees. People don't know much about why these people come into Europe or leaving everything in their homes. And I realized that as a filmmaker, you have in every story beginning, middle, and end. And for me, this crisis were the end of the story. So I went to the borders, I went to Syria, I went to all the Middle Eastern countries that surround in Syria, and I tried to reconstruct everything step by step. So it was the beginning with the revolution, an inspiration for the kids, then this revolution, peaceful revolution, became a violence, then it transparently went into the civil war, then from civil war it went to the proxy war, and then it resulted at the 
refugee crisis. So for me, I wanted to tell a comprehensive story versus the small media segments that media was showing since 2015, because the Western media was kind of not pointing to the elements what's happening in Syria from 2011 up, up until 2015, until the war was in full fledged. So my goal was to educate people and to tell what brought to this Syrian crisis, refugee crisis, that these people are seeking shelter, why are they living in their own homes, what are they seeking. I think that was the big goal. And at the same time, it was a big, uh, for me, in terms of to tell to the people, hey, we need to wake up. We haven't seen war. That's the war. We haven't know what is this to lose freedom of speech or freedom of uh, expression, and they are fighting for that. So it was a different element that I wanted to tell to the world through my art and through this comprehensive story. And uh, I want to note that um, oftentimes I've noticed when it comes to something as exotic in terms of its location from us, uh, and uh, as complex as Syria is, I think it, seem, it seems like that complexity is sort of used as an excuse not to really care and to sort of say, that's crazy problems happening over there. We can't get involved. That seems to be the, that's the temper of the moment. Sometimes the temper of the moment is we should get involved, but either way, complexity is almost like, is, is, a, is a huge obstacle, I think, and it's the same with the Armenian Genocide, which has 100 years of uh, distance to add to its geographic distance uh, from the c current mind. Uh, how did you try to simplify the story for our stupid little uh, affluent minds uh, without sacrificing the, you know, the truth. You know what, I, I learned when I started to do documentaries, by the way, I not started with the musicals in Israel. The first documentary that I did, I did on 16 millimeter camera when I was 16 years old in Russia. You forgot to tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, I did. I want to see it. <laughs> uh, I will try to find this. And actually, in my home here in Los Angeles, I have still my 16 millimeter camera. Yeah, yeah good. I do, I do, I do. So, uh, you know what? It's not about uh, sacrificing truths because you, as a documentary filmmaker, you can go there, you can learn, you can educate yourself about simple things that these people trying to achieve on what they did, and learning about them, you're starting to tell, you're starting to craft your story. Now, I try to learn simple things. In the same time, I also learned, like you said, to simple minds. You know what, when you're telling the story, sophisticated and complicated like this, you need to remember one thing. In America, we have a series of the books called For Dummies. Right. Mm -hmm. I own the one on Bridge. Okay. Yeah. I learned when I was doing Winter on Fire that you need to start from the scratch, from the ground zero, and slowly educate people. That's why I have maps where each country exists. Like in the Ukrainian movie, I was showing in the map where is Ukraine. Right. In the Syrian situation, I was showing Syria. And educating them what happened prior to that, what is following each event, and that's how I usually craft in my story. So I try to educate people from the ground zero without sacrificing truth. Because you know what? It's not my story. It's their story. And I always involving in my projects people who've been on the ground. Like, for example, I had all the time Syrian activists with me seeing the cuts and literally going and following all the steps that I was doing. In Ukrainian, since I was there, it was much more easy. But Syria I was reconstructing. So I was having with me all the time Syrian <coughs> activists who've been involved in different places, and that's helped me to craft the story. That's great to hear, because uh, it leads directly to the technical question and an abstract question which I'm going to pose to everybody. First, the technical question. How did you get your hands? Most of the Syria film is footage that was taken on the ground by Syrians on cell phones, and, uh, and it's very grisly footage. Um, and uh, how did you get it? I mean, how did you go about acquiring and getting the permission to use it and all that, technically speaking? Um, we ended with 20 terabytes of footage that my editor crafted in 11 weeks on Arabic language. An editor came from here, from Los Angeles, actually. Amazing Aaron Butler. So uh, how I did it, I will tell you. First, I learned about Syrian mentality or mentality of the Middle East. And you need 
to like each of these fascinating directors, we knowing that we need to connect to our characters and establish connection, trust, director and actor or director and character. I established this with most of my characters. And when you trust it by them, in the Middle East, they starting to refer you, to refer to the somebody else, and then this one, because of the referral, recommending to somebody else. Now, for Syrian people, at the beginning, I was a challenge because I came from the West, and they were thinking that Western, out, Western people don't want to know anything about Syria, so we betrayed them. I needed to convince them to trust me as somebody who coming from the Western uh, world and able to tell their complexity and their story to the world and bring attention to the crisis. So in a second I achieved this, people started to bring me their footage because they wanted this story to be told. So it was the challengeable beginning where I needed to bridge all these issues and then in a second they trusted me and believed in me, they started to bring me footage, recommend me to the next person, and this next person was bringing me his footage, and groups, activists, everybody were bringing the footage. So, like I said, we gained almost 20 terabytes of footage, the most sophisticated archives right now. And you made a comment, which is, is interesting to me. You called yourself in one of the articles about this film, uh, in the run-up to the release, you called yourself a freedom fighter. And so that was your role in this film, was a freedom fighter. Now, freedom fighter is not always compatible with storyteller. It can be, but it's not always. And so this question is for everybody. Because you've all dealt with uh, politically uh, contentious, at least, uh, you know, theory uh, uh, topics. H how do you, I'm sure you felt like freedom fighters at times, or maybe not. How do you, what do you consider your role? Uh, Terry, Reggie, even Angela. Um, what do you consider when it comes to this the line between being a storyteller and being a freedom fighter? Mm -hmm. There's a great quote by uh, Gordon Parks, great photographer, filmmaker, and he talks about a choice of weapons, right? So he chose a camera, and with that camera, he was going to tell the truth, and the truth is a very powerful weapon. So um, <clears throat> when you're making movies, whether it's a documentary or, or a scripted film, you're trying to get to a truth, and truth is elusive, truth is complicated, and that's the challenge of our job. But, you know, so I, I, I make the same choice as Gordon Parks. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And when, uh, I remember when I was doing In the Name of the Father with Jim Sheridan, and uh, a conservative paper, uh, the Daily Telegraph in London, called us up, because there had been a lot of accusations about we'd uh, we'd made the story up, these guys were guilty, it was all bullshit, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and Jim Sheridan, my best friend and the director, was on the phone. And Jim's given to mythological thinking and talking and so forth. I don't know if you've ever heard him, it's something else. Uh, anyway, he said, uh, I, they, I, I kind of got the gist of the question, well, is this the truth? And he says, no, it's a greater truth. It's a distillation of the truth. The Daily Telegraph went apeshit with that. It was like, you know, here's these, they're distilling the truth. But it was actually, that's exactly right. We take, in feature film, you take the actual drama, the, the events that took place, and you sound paper those down to their essence. And the most important thing for me is to stick to the basics of the truth. Because if you, if you manipulate the story, uh, in any way to suit your particular dramatic vein, it's going to collapse the whole thing. And there have been situations, that, uh, uh, for me, the, 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 the most, not egregious one, because I thought it was wrong, was with Hurricane, mm -hmm. with uh, Denzel, mm -hmm. where the New York Times took it apart and d d over one particular issue that I thought was wrong and destroyed it. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, but having said that about the freedom fighter thing, it, it's, you're always telling, there's, I, there's no objectivity in my point of view. I'm telling a story from a particular point of view, but I'm, I'm maintaining the, the truth of the facts. This is my perspective on it, uh, and I don't ever claim to be objective, because if you point the camera for 30 seconds that way and five seconds that way, you've already made a subjective decision. Right. So, so you, you are, you're a partisan storyteller, uh, but a partisan for the truth, I believe. 
I can speak about this as an actress, and I think that there's so many, there's a lot of activism and a lot of things that are going on right now where we, as people, also stand up for women's rights and, and so many things. And um, I can say that I, I feel the strongest when I, when I play a part because it's through the part that I'm able to reveal the story that I want to tell. And a lot of the time, uh, for example, uh, working on the films that I've worked on, specifically 1915 or The Promise, I'm telling the story about this particular woman, but through my being. So I would prefer to, to state that activism, if I can, through the story than, than fighting or screaming or, or saying hateful things, but I would like to stand through storytelling, and, and I think that's what art is. I was listening to Gary Oldman talk about working on Churchill, and he was saying how he had watched other actors from the past, and it was their point of view, but then he had watched footage from Churchill and said he had seen something completely different. He had seen a big baby, and and he had seen someone that, that wanted to do so many things, and he was able to reveal that softness about him that he hadn't seen other actors do. And I think that's what, that's what we do as actors or filmmakers, that we, we tell the story, you know? So I guess that's what I could say about that. And let me comment to that. <laughs> you can't comment okay. on your own comments. Uh, okay. You had your chance <laughs> with Deadline.com. Go ahead. 2nd of November, mm -hmm. New York. Actually, it was Brooklyn. Uh, I think it's Critics' Choice Awards where I did this comment from the stage. And uh, I was referring to everybody in the audience. I received uh, from Amazing Barbara Couple awards for the best director. And I was referring to everybody in the auditorium. Because at the end of the day, we are all freedom tellers. We are all freedom fighters. We're fighting for the truth to be told because in these days, when the media telling either one-sided stories or telling the stories that is sexy enough or commercial enough, and then a lot of stuff is kind of left outside. And I'm referring a lot of times to Syria because like last year, United States learned only about one chemical attack. And everybody remember that, but it was over 12 chemical attacks mm -hmm. through the year and media kind of left them aside. So when we, as the filmmakers, and I'm referring to everybody, scripted or documentary, we go in and we're telling the stories about characters who fought for the rights, who fought for freedom, who fought for different kind of situations, we're trying to tell the story and we're trying to tell the truth and educate people. So we are storytellers and we are freedom fighters. That's how I interpret these things. And uh, this is a great uh, segue into, I think, the question of choosing the story, because that's what we're talking about. Choosing the story is where you make your, you put your point, your, your, your plant on the point of view, the character and what he wants, and that's, that's who you are. So I want to, I want to use this as an opportunity to get into Marshall. First, I'll introduce, I will, uh, uh, Re Reginald Hudlin's background. Uh, he first burst upon the scene uh, with the comedy House Party in 1990, I believe it was, mm -hmm. and has since then had an immensely versatile career, uh, directing and writing and producing big comedies, working on some of our favorite TV shows, Bernie Mac, The Office, Modern Family, uh, the, mini the uh, animated series of Black Panther. Um, he was also a producer on Django Unchained. And uh, most recently, he, r he directed a film called Marshall, a technically a biopic about Chief Justice, uh, not Chief Justice, but Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Um, but really is, is more stylistically a combination of a courtroom drama and a kind of buddy lawyer comedy, uh, which would be appeal to all the lawyers in this room, <laughs> especially the ones who have buddies. <laughs> and uh, so let's play, uh, this is, is a brief teaser clip uh, from Marshall, uh, where uh, Thurgood Marshall, as a lawyer for the NAACP before he becomes a chief justice, uh, a justice of the Supreme Court, meets a client uh, that he's about to represent. Mr. Spell, I'm Thurgood Marshall with the NAACP. You heard of us. 
You a lawyer? I am. This is Sam Friedman. He's a lawyer, too. Hey, you can go. Got no money for lawyers. Anybody ask you for money? Did you rape that woman, Joseph? No. Why does she say you did? I don't know why she's saying that. She says you raped her and tried to kill her. She lied. I'm telling you this up front. The NAACP were not like most lawyers. We only represent innocent people, people accused because of their race. That's our mission. You understand? So I need to know this. Look at me now. Did you do what they said you did? I never touched that woman. OK, Joseph. You got lawyers now. So question the first is, why did you choose that case? Because there's a, this is a law, uh, Thurgood Marshall worked on for Brown versus Board of Education, the huge case that overturned uh, racial segregation in, in schools. He was, of course, a uh, Supreme Court justice with who knows how many opinions he wrote and how many cases. You chose a case before any of that. Why? Well, it was, I was always a giant fan of Thurgood Marshall. Uh, as a person, I mean, you know, obviously we all adore Martin Luther King. Some of us adore Malcolm X. Uh, I feel like Thurgood Marshall in, uh, is equal to, you know, the achievements of, I would say, if you're going to do the black Mount Rushmore, I'd go <laughs> Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Thurgood Marshall. And um, Thurgood Marshall is the least known. And and I feel like in some ways he's unique from the other three because the others broke the law. They broke the law in search of justice, but they were lawbreakers. Thurgood was a lawmaker. He transformed the law through his courtroom trials and then as a Supreme Court justice. And for me, the, you know, the final achievement of fighting for freedom, fighting for justice, is to be in that position of power and to use it responsibly. So I thought it was, he was an important person to me. And when the script came to me, this was the story. And I thought, God, this is very chronological for all the things you just said. I mean, you know, the man lived a very long life and had incredible achievements his whole life. So when you look at a person like this, you can say, OK, we can try to do his whole life, which is basically watching a movie on fast forward. You will never be able to go deep into any of the amazing things he did. Or you can make a very hard choice and pick a story. And I would hope that most people learned about Brown versus the Board of Education somewhere in fifth or sixth grade. You know, one never knows. But um, I thought if you do that movie, then people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know that. I've seen that. But this was a story people did not know. This was a story that felt like it could have happened last week. It felt completely relevant and current to issues today. It was a story set in the North, because I feel like as a genre of civil rights cinema, we've seen enough tobacco chewing sheriffs and got it, you know? <laughs> as my kids would say, and we were cleaning out the book today at five Harriet Tubman books. We're like, we got it, Dad. And so like, oh, you know, we haven't seen Northern racism. So a movie set in Connecticut, I thought was refreshing to see people who, oh, you know, we're better than those people down there. But you know, they have the same institutional racism, uh, which feels more like how institutions function today. Um, and here's Ado, and and we get to see another side of the man, that he's young, he's got this super sarcastic sense of humor. Um, he's really an investigator. And he's doing this incredibly courageous thing. I mean, here's a guy who lives in Harlem at the height of the Harlem Renaissance. He's hanging out with celebrities. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got a perfect life. And he takes these cases, and he gets on a train, and he goes to hell. You know, when you go to Alabama and Tennessee and Oklahoma, these are, people, these are places that will kill you if you're there after sundown as a black person. So to go to these towns who say, you know, 
we don't think you're human, we will kill you, and say, not only will you acknowledge my humanity, I will convince you that you were wrong, and you will, you will, uh, you will let my, my client, who's being unjustly tried, free. That is a freedom of spirit. That is an arrogance. That is extraordinary. And <laughs> and to see, and I wanted to show that cockiness, you know, because I mean, I think early civil rights setting was all about look how wonderful and noble these people are. It's like, no, let's show him as a rock star, you know. And I want to see him like he's got fly clothes, he's cool, <laughs> and you know, he's not he's not a minister. He's not doing this for nobility. He's not anti-violence. You know, he'll put foot to ass. Right. You know, and he does in the movie. He does multiple in the movie. times. And what's what's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing. Choice of weapons. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I I detect a few interesting themes in mm -hmm. in your answer. Uh, one of which is the desire to reverse cliches that have seemed to kind of become entrenched in movies about a particular topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you specifically said like you didn't want the old the old uh, uh, gum chewing, straw chewing, ding ding ding, ding southern, you know, <laughs> nonsense. You you wanted a different. You wanted to show something something else. Mm -hmm. You wanted to. I f it feel like you avoid depicting victimhood in this movie, which is a probably a common a common emotion that that comes out of movies about racism. Mm -hmm. um, was that a th was that a particular desire, or was it just sort of this is this is a man who did not sit down? Yeah, I would, to me, I mean, you know, I, I hate to knock a movie that was probably made with the best of intentions, right? Knock it. But um, you look at a movie like Mississippi Burning, right? Um, which is what I, ha what I call the baby seal syndrome. Like, don't hit baby seals. Baby seals are just really cute. And, you know, they did not depict the people who were being oppressed in the South with any agents, agency of their own. And I thought, well, wait a minute. This, there's a million stories about agency. Uh, but you're going to make the heroes of the movie the FBI, who, you know, at the, at the least did nothing <coughs> to, I mean, there's people, you know, there's no more Black Panthers left, but there's still the Klan. I mean, what happened there? there that, that's a failure of mission. You know, they, you know there's, there's a terrorist organization that has operated in the United States for almost 100 years now. Mm. And we just let it happen. They're not even on the list of terrorist organizations, and they kill people all the time. So that makes me ask you, how, how far in the forefront of your mind is addressing the present when you do a film about the past? Because I think it's unavoidable to think, like, how, how does this shed light on issue X, Y, and Z, which is maybe it's the same issue, but the same issue trans you know, uh, transferred 70 years into the future. Um, it may not may be just a related issue in the case of the Armenian genocide and and refugee the refugee crisis today. These aren't the same issues, but they're related. And the temptation to to comment upon them when you're doing a film about the past must be strong. So I wanted to open that up to all of you. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, uh, massage that instinct? I don't think that works. That metaphor <laughs> works. But well, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really hard because I think I mean certainly in the case of the themes of Marshall. I mean, there is a genuine racial fatigue in America. And that's, you know, blacks and whites. It's like, OK, enough, got it. Things were bad. You know, so um, I think that's where our integrity as artists come in. You've got to tell a good story. You can't say, but the issue is so important. You need to care. I mean, if your sales pitch is, this is an important film, you have failed. You know? I mean, people work hard all week. Right, so at the end of the week, after end of a hard week, you want them to leave the house, pay for a sitter, pay, f you know, drive in their car to go to the movie theater. In that, you don't want them to wait for Netflix. You want them to go now. So you you want to defy gravity, and get people to pay money to go see the movies. That's a lot. And you go once you get there, there's 13 movies. Right? Why are they picking your movie? You know, look, look, Jumanji's right over there. <laughs> that looks fun. A, a riveting tale about <laughs> animal rights abuse. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing is, you've got to, if, if, you know, if you want to send a message, you better not just talk, be talking to your friends. You know, me and my 12 friends all agree this is very important. 
you have failed. You, you know, if, if your weapon is a camera and, you know, you call yourself a communicator with the world, then you better figure out how to get the world to get people who don't agree with you to see your movie and have a conversation. Yeah. No, uh, amen to that. I mean, we, we, um, primarily we're entertainers. That's the, the number one obligation is uh, to put asses in seats, paying asses and to then repay back the people who, who gave you the money or whatever in the fullness of time. You know, and I remember I was on a panel, I think it was in Germany, where, where someone, maybe it was Sharon again or somebody said, whatever you do, don't put your psychosis on screen. Go and see a psychiatrist. You know? <laughs> And then I looked around at like six German filmmakers, and I guess <laughs> 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 but it, it, but it, it, it's about it's it's entertainment, and and I think for us, if you pick a difficult subject, then the demands of the script are even greater. The, the, the script better sing, because, yeah, I, I, the Rwandan genocide. I really want to read a story about that. That's great. Or the Armenian genocide or the Irish hunger strike or whatever, it then comes down to telling that story. But at the same time, and with Marshall, we are, we are, in, we are universalizing the humanity of our characters. And, and I'm gonna, I was warned about this, but I'm going to preempt it. Don Cheadle and I had a, had a mantra word on Hotel Rwanda, which I then transferred to The Promise, which was Peoria. And it meant, if they don't get it in Peoria, Illinois, we fail. <laughs> because uh, you have to be able to play today in Belfast, Beirut, and Beijing. Mm, That's yeah. the nature of the business. And, and the story needs to be, therefore, universalized. You know, and, and, and the, the promise was about three people caught up in this you know, horrendous uh, war and holocaust who between each other find their humanity and their greatness, and it applies as much today as relevantly to the Syrian crisis as it did 100 years ago in the same region. Uh, and that's why I continue to look for really, I, I can't help it. I, I just optioned the rights to a book called A Disappearance in Damascus, mm -hmm. which is about to, uh, a, a woman journalist going to Damascus in 2007 to investigate the plight of Iraqi refugees and finds a really close friendship with her fixer, an Iraqi woman, who has then disappeared into the Syrian prison system. Now, how the hell am I going to... Can you imagine that pitch at Disney? <laughs> <laughs> it's, but I, 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 when I read the book, the humanity of those two women and the capacity of their love for each other, uh, their strength and what happens to them, explains that situation in Damascus, that alien place, better than anything I thought. So, so the, the, the onus is on me now. I better get a script to match their story and try to sell it. Mm -hmm. I want to get really specific while we're on Peoria, mm -hmm. um, which is where did that come up? Like, what did Don Cheadle do? What did Oscar Isaac do that got you to say, Peoria, and warn him? So, uh, what, where did that come, come in on set? Well, we... we you know, we'd be doing things like trying to explain the, the, the inter a hamway, or we'd be discussing a piece of dialogue that, that, that I'd written and then realized was expositional and we didn't need it. And, and, and it's like you have to be, it has to be universal enough that you're not complicating the situation. Explain it as clearly as you can. The great thing about Hotel Room, well, the, the, in storytelling about Hotel Rwanda was the bad guys wore these incredible colored shirts. The UN wore these blue hats, <laughs> and the Rwandan government wore ordinary military and the ordinary civilian. So I had, I had like a visual map already set out, and using that and just using the key words and let, let the characters themselves declare their humanity. So each time we got into being expositional or... or you know, trying to be too complex in the story, Peoria would come up. And likewise in The Promise, which was even more difficult because you're 100 years back in a war that no one had really any knowledge about at all. So, and I, I, I know when if I ever get to make uh, Disappearance in Damascus, I'll be using Peoria a lot. Right. Yeah. 
uh, the namesake of this theater, Billy Wilder, uh, said uh, a lot of unforgettable things, which I can't remember, but I think one of them was, <laughs> I think one of them was, uh, you, you can be subtle so long as it's obvious, yeah. right? <laughs> so that seems to fit your, to, yeah. uh, yeah. your... Exactly, yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's the trick. Before we get into the, you want to say something? Okay. Go. You know what, uh, talking about connecting stuff uh, for the things that we're doing, I want to give you a sample. Vinch on Fire, we were just talking about that on a backstage, and you said that you looked at this and it re basically reminded you something about Armenia. Exactly. I want to tell you about connection here. You're telling a story sometimes, but you need to think how you connect the story to people, for example, to here in the United States or in European Union or in Latin America. And I think with Winter on Fire, I achieved this because when I was doing my Syrian journey, when it was Christ from Syria, I learned that in 2016, Latin America, Brazil used Winter on Fire, a position used against the dictatorship and government there in Brazil. And I know it was there. It's them who adapted the story understandable enough and inspirational enough for them to see how human were the people, protesters on the Maidan Square, and how it was helpful for them to use everything what's happened there against their current government. Then last year, 2017, I witnessed even more fascinating thing for me. I saw pictures from Caracas, from Venezuela, where they were screening Winter on Fire on the streets, in underground, in libraries, mm. in the schools, mm. and it became their manual for their revolution. And it was like, I, I read articles in the Reuters, and I was like, what? Winter on Fire in, inspired Latin America. So that was the most unique thing that I saw in my movies, and this inspired me to go take another stories, and like, when I was crafting Christ from Syria, I saw how many different things were kind of helping me to translate this story into different nationalities, different moments, and I see how, for example, I can easily translate it into the, you know what, they were fighting for their freedom of speech and their democracy, and to lose something like this is very easy, but to gain, you can see the sample. They're fighting for six years right now. And then you can see what's happening in our own country, and then you can find a lot of similarities. I can go on and on and on. It can point you line by line how similar sometimes certain situations between Syria and European Union, Syria and United States. And it's uh, what I'm trying to bring in my movies. I'm trying to connect dots and stories to our days. I think that's the important thing for me. And Winter on Fire was a great sample for right. me. And, and but I mean, when I was a kid, there was this series on PBS called The Japanese Film with Edward O. Reinschauer. <laughs> and <clears throat> he went through all the classics of Japanese cinema. So I'll be watching this movie, this series on PBS. I learned about Kurosawa and Ozu and all that. And so, you know, you know, Kurosawa had a huge impact on me. And Kurosawa wasn't thinking about me as an audience member. Mm -hmm. He was just being a great storyteller. And, you know, plugging into that universal, you know, and, and it, so I'm stealing from Rashomon as much as I can when I'm making Marshall. Um, and and that, so and then the moral is you can be very culturally specific and plug into a universal, which is exactly what you're describing with the response to your movies around the world. Or me and my brother's response when we saw In the Name of the Father, it was just like, exactly, exactly, <laughs> you know? Because, uh, you know, when you, when you see truth, you feel it. Mm. It resonates through your body. Yeah, yeah. It's a great feeling. You just go, that truth on the other side of the world inspired me to step it up. And when you, know, you bring in the... Oh. I was just going to say to that that uh, I think that's what I love about acting is because mm. there are performances that have lived with me that happened in 1945, and I remember watching it and thinking, I don't know how that life just happened, but it was a cathartic experience. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about filmmaking. That's, a, that's what I love about storytelling, because I think that we have permission maybe to do the things that we're not necessarily allowed in real life. We're allowed, with creative license, to have some of the most intimate things that we can have in front of that camera in that moment. Mm. So if I look back to, let's say, Mama Roma with Ana Magnani, and I see how she's laughing at the beginning of this 
this party, and it's about a prostitute. It's about what women were at this time in Italy. I think, my goodness, this woman was so powerful and fearless and, and, and creative in this moment, portraying what we would all look down on. And, and you see this vitality in her. And similar to that, there is like, there's so many films. And so I have such, uh, I guess, I'm just so moved when I see the kinds of films that you all make. I'm such fans of your work. And so I love that, that I get to be a part of this panel in this moment to, to talk about these things. I want to add something interesting. When you said about stage and when we're going back to the movies, you know what is different for me, stage and the movies, why I always wanted to make movies and I'm making movies? Stage, when you're directing stage, it's the moment that we're creating for the audience. It lives with us a certain time. And slowly, with different memories, it's covered and covered and covered. Everybody here creating a cultural monument that can live centuries. Mm. With every digital new development, it transforms from 35 into something else and then into something else. But it's a cultural monument. We're creating the cultural monument with the help of the great actors. And these cultural monuments have the messages to change hearts and minds. And that's what we're doing. So that's how it lives beyond us and creates the legacy and changing the world for the better. This is a great place to talk about terror. Let's clap for that. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a great place to talk about Terry's work, uh, Terry George, that is. Um, I feel like I've, I've, I feel like film, at least for 100 years, is the language of memory. And uh, that is a that is a fact that has created an immense burden, for example, in the Armenian people who for 100 years have lived alone with memories of what happened. And by alone, I mean because everyone else either didn't care or told them it didn't happen. And so a filmmaker comes along tasked with the burden of relieving them of these memories by depicting them on screen in the language of memory. Terry has Terry has met this burden in numerous uh, uh, stories, uh, beginning in, with his career as, a, of course, an Irish uh, scriptwriter and director. He, he's he's uh, brought a lot of stories about Northern Ireland to life, uh, most notably, perhaps, is In the Name of the Father, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, which he wrote and Jim Sheridan directed. He then, of course, went on to make the definitive movie about the Rwandan genocide, uh, Hotel Rwanda, starring Don Cheadle. And most recently, he directed the first big Hollywood American huge production, um, the, the, which has been 80, 90 years in the making in, a, some, in some sense or another, about the Armenian genocide called The Promise, in which Angela Serafian plays a role. Um, <laughs> so, so we, we want to talk, talk about, about a lot of. A lot of issues that, have, that, that I'm sure he encountered in The Promise. Let us show the clips my true loves in the booth for The Promise. There's going to be two clips here. It's going to be the first one's The Promise. Second one is a, the behind the scenes documentary called Intent to Destroy, in which you see Terry directing Oscar Isaac in that very same scene. Oh, 
The thing that be careful about is just whatever way you lift her, we can't see what you see. So maybe if she's lying across like this, and you go to turn turn her around to see her, then you see what's. Well, if, if, I, if she's facing that way, yeah, and you're, and you're facing that way, yeah, she's uh, on her body, belly. Yeah, your body's like that way, and then I I notice that it's her, and I bring her here, and then I I would look down and yeah. see that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, well, you can't see that there's blood up here, right? Well, we see a bit of blood on her face, yeah. But I think this should be soaked from blood. Why? Well, there's a, because it's always better for the audience to presume than, than what... You know, if there's yeah. blood, then we'll you're not going to see bit, that it's you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, um, yeah, there's a couple of things going on there. <laughs> For A, or no, well, it's B. I'll talk about B first, the B reason. The B reason was that I was crucially aware throughout the film that I wanted a PG-13 rating, mm -hmm. that children, teenagers, schools, people who don't want to go to our films would see this film. But you can't say that to an actor in the middle. Of, right, by the way, I'm thinking of the MPAA here. I mean, that's... <laughs> Beyond sacrilege, but luckily I had an A reason for a, a creative reason, and it, um, and I, I believe this all along. There are certain things that you you can't convey on re, re, real life uh, things that can't be conveyed on on, on film and feature films, and when I watched Gavani, uh, Gavani's, um, uh little clip there from Syria. Um, the man being shot dead. I had the misfortune in Northern Ireland uh, when I was growing up of seeing someone shot dead. They don't fall, they melt. They, there's no, in a feature film, I've never seen anyone really be able to pull off what I witnessed on the Falls Road. And, and, and so when it comes to that, came to that scene as well, because what you're seeing is that Angela has not only been killed, but her child has been, her unborn child has been ripped from her belly. Um, and I remember, and later on in the film, Oscar Isaac tells us that in a much more emotive way than any piece of blood up here could have done. And I also remember from The Searchers, one of my favorite films ever, there's a scene where John Wayne rides into a canyon. He's looking for his two nieces who have uh, be, uh, been kidnapped by the Comanches. And he comes back out again, and their, uh, their brother or their cousin is, uh, wants to go into the canyon. And he punches him and throws him and screams, don't ever go in there. You can't. And right away, m my head as a, a kid watching that, and everybody in the audience is thinking, Oh my God! What what was that? Must have been like in the canyon. What happened to that poor girl? The suggestion in the audience's head is is almost be better in those situations than trying to convey something that in reality you can't convey. Mm. Yeah, and 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 one of the I mean that was a very emotive day for us. Poor Angela had to lie there playing dead, <laughs> which is equally hard. Uh, um, but but uh, it it's just. Capturing, you know, we used the photo photographs uh, from uh, the history to recreate that scene, and yet, what it's the emotional impact on the audience and on humanity itself that you're trying to convey, and you're never going to get to what that reality must have been like itself. But to try to generate that in the audience is the challenge that we have. 
Um, I'd like to, since, since we just saw Angela in, in The Promise, um, I'd like to uh, bring her into this very same conversation by showing a uh, clip of her in another movie. First, let me give you Angela's background, since we haven't talked about it. Angela, of course, has, has appeared in so many uh, great films and television series, going back to Twilight and uh, Paranoia and... Uh, she is. She was in the second Twilight. The second Twilight. She was in. Angela There's Serafian nothing wrong with that name. movie either, but I wasn't in it. It was a work of an auteur, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, she was, was. most recent. Of course, she's most recently everyone's favorite character in Westworld, oh. as Clementine, and um, her particular relevance, of course, to this panel, is that she has appeared in the only two feature films about the Armenian Genocide produced in the United States, of course, in The Promise. And a year before that, she was in a film called 1915, in which uh, I co-wrote and directed with Garin Hovhannisyan, the uh, founder of Creative Armenia. We had the honor of directing her as the, the lead in that film. Um, and that was an unusual psychological mystery set and released in 2015 on the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. The clip we are going to see now is from that movie. In that movie, there is a play being staged in which Angela is playing a woman from 1915 on the killing fields who is being offered a chance to escape by a Turkish colonel. And Angela, as the actress playing this role, is unable to do what is scripted for her to do, which is take his hand. My comrades in the booth, can we please play 1915 clip? This is our last chance. On the other side of this night, there's only death for you and damnation for me. Come, honey. Let us save each other from our destinies. Take the curlist hand, honey. That's all you have to do. No. Honey, take the man's hand. No. I'm not going to leave him. I won't. I won't leave my baby. Ani, sam artun cerkle pordi verchanak. Chem, chem karo, voch mi haikin cher karo askta. Ani, ik ne kumi ak per kuchuna. Hedo gar nas tsekeli de, aitsi ma hedo beti atas. No, no. Ani, you're gonna die. The entire Armenian people are gonna die because of you. Take his hand. No. Let go. Simon, no, no. No, Chemosu! No! No, this is my decision! This is my decision! So, Angela, what was it like? First it was of all, it's great working with you, Alex. Hmm? <laughs> Did you say it was or wasn't? You're an amazing director. You and Godin balance each other out perfectly. Master of understatement. <laughs> um, what was it like performing three roles, because she had two roles in this film, as Angela, the actress, in 2015, and as Ani, the, uh, the, uh, the woman from 1915, and a third role, of course, in The Promise, as Maral, right? That was your name in yes. The Promise. What was it like playing these three roles within two years of each other, mm. 100 years apart, well, I live with two. Uh, well, I I lived with two very Armenian women, my my grandmother and my mother. So I have seen a lot of strength, a lot of opinions, a lot of a lot of a lot of Armenianness in this house, and a lot of warmth and love. And I thought it would really be an honor for me to be able to portray some elements of those qualities that I've seen in them in these roles, which are very different. Um, with with Ani um, and Angela, uh, I explored. Well, it, it was it was interesting because it's about that one moment where you make the decision in the film, and it was an interesting thing trying to figure out how we would create that. But what, but within doing that, I I realized that looking back at my ancestors, my great 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 grandmother. They had to make decisions. One of them had my my father's, I guess, grandmother would have been grandmother's mother. She threw herself in what is called a tonid. It's it's what you bake bread in. 
It's uh, in the ground, and it's hot. And she had two children. So she threw herself in that and killed herself in front of her children who became orphans while, while they were taking all the Armenians on this march. So her children ran away, and they were separated in, in, in their march. The girl went to an, joined an orphanage, and the other, the boy, they never saw each other again. So I had this opportunity to explore this moment where you take the colonel's hand and you live or, or you go with your child. And it was very complicated when the movie came out because a lot of Armenian women in the audiences would say, well, no, an Armenian woman would never do that. She would never take his hand. And I said, you don't know because you haven't been there. You don't know what people do. And so when I got to play Maral, um, I remember that scene. I remember that day when I was walking through. I was like, oh, they're just dead bodies. Like, they're dummies and whatever. And, and then I went home, and that day there was like a little EPK thing. And I started crying, because uh, sorry, I guess. It, it lives in us. It was the same that day, actually, when we were recreating the, the whole scene. There were, there were a lot of um, <coughs> Armenians involved as, you know, in the actors and in the extras, and uh, and some on the crew, and and they. I mean, it was a hugely emotional day, and you have to, you you have to, uh, you have to realize that's the the the, the burden, the onus put on you to. To, to pay homage to that event itself. It's not, yeah, it, it's interesting. Uh, another writer, uh, Peter Balakian, uh, great Armenian uh, American writer, r sent me a script and in it, it's from his, from his book called Black Dog of Fate. And he has a scene in it that, that's true from the Armenian uh, genocide at that time where the, the Turkish women, are, are, are sorry, Armenian women are gathered in a square and they, um, Turkish soldiers pour tar over them and set them on fire, and they're running through the school. And I, I, I had to say to, uh, I, I had to say to Peter, that's that's going to be a that is really a really hard scene for me to conceptualize how how to shoot that. And then two nights later, I'm watching a vampire movie, <laughs> and six people burst into flames and run around the room and all the rest of it, and it's. But, and I'm like, yeah, it's a vampire movie. They burst, in, you know, the sun comes out, they burst into flames. <laughs> What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is we are charged with transforming reality onto screen and telling a true, once you say this is a true story, the audience goes to a different place and it better be a true story. And, and, and for the life of me, I couldn't see setting, you know, in a, a true story, setting women on fire and filming that as a scene to, to convey the story. I could find a way to have that story told or, or film the people's faces just before it happened or whatever. But you, you do have this onus in the films we make when you're telling the truth to, 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 to be, you know, pay homage to history, to be careful about what you're recreating and to pass that legacy on. Because as you said, that we are creating history for people living. People are going to go back. The history of the of the Holocaust will be remembered through mostly through Schindler's List. That's the way people will reference it. They'll reference the Cambodian genocide, probably through the Killing Fields and and Angelina Jolie's last movie, Hotel Rwanda, along with several other good movies, will be the Rwandan. We are passing on, on history down to to uh, and that's a gift that has to be cherished, and I'm very careful about that, uh, you know, when I'm writing and also in talking about it, that this is not Transformers. People are going to remember this. It may not do great at the box office you know, the first time around, but it's going to be seen again and again, and it's going to be seen in schools, and people are going to talk about it. And like when I went to Armenia, the whole Armenian nation was so grateful because we have recorded in a way that's communicatable to the rest of the world in, 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 in the best way possible, what just a little snippet of what that was like for history. 
And and working on it in that particular moment, I realized it's something. It's something very. Something became very clear to me. What became clear is the orphans in the film were the orphans that they were my ancestors. In that moment, l when I was lying there and I was seeing seeing those little kids running or or the people that were dying, I was like, "That's what happened." If the orphans hadn't run away, I would not be here now. I just wouldn't exist. So uh, it's interesting what happens in the process of making a film. And uh, I want to get back to the issue both of the Schindler's List, you know why, and, uh, and to confronting literally real people because some of these characters, in the case of the Armenian Genocide, the real people are uh, no longer with us for the most part. Some of them, I guess, no longer anymore. Um, and, uh, but in other films, such as the, the one you just finished shooting, you're playing a real person who's probably alive. I'm assuming. Um, for yeah, yes. if you could comment on that, what that experience. You're playing a, in just a little bit of background. Uh, Angela is has a role in the forthcoming film about Ted Bundy, biopic uh, directed by Joe Berlinger, who did the documentary, um, and she plays a, a friend of his wife. I believe it is. Um, you can correct me. But yeah, so so um, uh, Ted Bundy's girlfriend and her best friend were the ones that called the cops and said that they know he was the guy. And, and they were able to, uh, amongst a lot of people, but they definably knew that it, he was the killer. So they played kind of an important part in it. And, and his girlfriend didn't want to believe it for years that this was a real thing. And it's funny, the day that we shot, the actual day that I, I, and I basically set up the girl that he is with, the one he falls in love with, the girlfriend, and Ted to meet for the first time. And that day, the actual girlfriend came to set, the, the real woman. And it was, it was fascinating meeting her because she, everything that we're talking about, about <sighs> all the things about abuse and, 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 and all the, these elements were really kind of explored in this film in a very extreme way. Um, so, so it's been it's been it's been fun. There isn't that much information on my character on Joanna, so th whatever I could find, I used. Um, but but reading about him, reading about why he made the decisions, looking at Charles Manson, for example, and the life that he led. So it, it's it's fascinating to kind of be a part of that kind of thing. And Reggie, I believe you dealt with this problem. In Marshall, mm -hmm. uh, from what I read, there was a the uh, the nephew of uh, Josh Gad's character, uh, Sam Friedman, the lawyer. There's a the the, the uh, uh, Josh Gad's character. If you remember from the clip, is a Jewish lawyer who Marshall teams up with and actually has to be the puppeteer of because Marshall's not permitted to talk as counsel in the courtroom, um, but he's allowed to be there and you know write little notes. So these are the two people who take on this case. The nephew of that man happens to be a film critic and had a quarrel with your depiction of his uncle, I believe. So right. you've dealt with this problem. Right. You well, you know, it, 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 uh, microphone. Um, the irony is <clears throat> the movie started where uh, there was a, a, a Connecticut-based attorney uh, whose children all lived in Hollywood and were working in the movie business. So he said, I'm going to write a script, which is what a lot of people say. And... <laughs> And being in Connecticut and being an attorney, he dug out all the legal files and he researched all the news stories. And he, in fact, wrote this script. And he sent it to the daughter of Sam Friedman. And she read the script and goes, I love this movie. This is an incredible movie about my father and Thurgood Marshall. So she said, I have a friend who's a big Hollywood producer. And sent it to Paula Wagner, mm -hmm. who then read it. And Paul and I uh, both are actually on the UCLA Board of Film uh, and Television and Theater. So we just said, oh, I know Reggie. Reggie, this, his, this is his kind of movie. And I'm like, yes, I'm in. I mean, I should read it first, but I'm in. So, um, so we had, you know, Sam Friedman's daughter there. And we, you know, we're, we're talking with the Marshall family. And one of the things we really talked about was casting. And... For example, with Thurgood Marshall, Thurgood Marshall uh, was a very light-skinned black man uh, with hair texture probably closer to yours. 
and we cast Chadwick Boseman, who's a darker skinned guy with a different uh, hair texture. So we asked the family, are you okay that we cast an actor who does not look exactly like your father? And the Marshall family said, if you told my father you weren't hiring the best possible actor because his skin was too dark, he would lose his mind. He would be furious. <laughs> so we said, okay, we're good with that call. And, you know, and, it, you know, and, um, um, uh, what's his name? Um, he, you know, so with, with, the, with the Freedmans, it was this kind of weird family fracas because like, the daughter was like, she didn't even know my father. What is he getting upset about? You know, it's my father. You know, and like this, you know, this is exactly what my dad was like. So they had beef, and I said, you know what? I'm not getting into a family argument. Right. You know, you're his daughter. You're here on set. You're, you've read the script. You see everything we're doing at every step. You're fine with it. Talk to your cousin. Right. And that's the thing we should keep in mind because in, nowadays everything is recorded. Every statement that is made is logged in Wikipedia, but what Wikipedia does not tell you in its footnotes is that every family has a nag and there's no <laughs> way around There's no way around just dealing with people who want to make a mess of things. Terry, when you did In the Name of the Father and other films, yeah. those... Well, In the, the Name of the Father in particular was, a, was a, a hornet's nest. First of all, we were shooting it while the war was still going on in Northern Ireland. And, and secondly, we were you know, claiming that the British justice system was basically totally corrupt from, start, from top to bottom. Um, and, and also, there were several families involved, uh, it, both on the, uh, the, the victim's side and in the legal side. There were, I think, 10 lawyers that represented them, all distilled down into uh, Emma Thompson's character. And 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 you would get all all of the you know all the different people who were involved. Paul Hill, who was one of the other defendants, had married into the Kennedy family by then, and wanted to tell his own story. Uh, and they they there was talk of an undercurrent of subterfuge to get us stopped. Um, Daniel didn't want Jerry Conlon, the real guy, on the set. For, for whatever his head was, was in. But we then had to go and tell Jerry Canlon, who at that time actually said that he was more famous than the Rolling Stones to us, <laughs> would show up in Dublin with Johnny Depp, who, who he had previously offered. Jerry Canlon had offered the part two. <laughs> <laughs> and all this was going on. Meanwhile, and it's actually one of the best scenes in the film, Jim Sheridan... Uh, wrote uh, the speech in the sale between the argument between Daniel between Jerry Conlon and his father, where Daniel says he, he he detested his father for his weakness and that he dreamt that he was dead and that he went to his grave and he pissed on his grave. Mm. Somehow, that page or that the the story of that got out to the Conlon family. Who then, who then blamed me as the scriptwriter for uh, for uh, creating a scene where Jerry Conlon was going to go and piss on his father's grave when he got out of prison, and they literally talked to the IRA about it and so forth, <laughs> and we had this whole scene where where somebody from Sinn Féin was sent to me to say, you can't be filming a scene in Milltown Cemetery where Jerry Conlon pisses on Giuseppe's grave. We're just not going to let you do it. Wow. And, I, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but but that, that, that's just a, an anecdote for that when you're doing, no, when you're doing nonfiction, when you're doing nonfiction, everybody's go, they're going to, two things are going to happen. They're going to want to know why they are or aren't portrayed. And they're going to hear a cash register ringing. And they're all going to pile on. And therefore, you have to, you have, beforehand, you have to get the rights sold down. And you have to stick to uh, the basic truth. And you have to decide what you're going to uh, distill and crystallize and how. I'm sure the, the Sam Friedman character, somebody in the family said, my, my father wasn't fat. And oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> Poor Josh you know. Yeah. 
Sam swam every day. Yeah. He was this slender, handsome man. <laughs> Why do you cast Josh Gad? Exactly. I'm like, mm, you know, it's funny. I faced that uh, when Joanna, the ac not Joanna, when the uh, actual woman was there on set, she said, Joanna didn't look like you. I was like, well, I know. I mean, I don't know what to do. She's short and fat. And I was like, I can't change that. But so when I, because I, I, I made the choice that the best friend she she checks out his ass, you know. She goes, oh, he's 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 a nice piece of ass. You should just go talk to him. I wanted her to be a little more flirtatious than just like a frumpy, short, fat ass, you know. I I just thought I thought you know maybe she drank a martini or maybe you know something interesting with the character. And she's like, those are all false information. And I think what we do is you stick to the truth, but it's your own truth, yeah, right? I mean, I mean, isn't it? Whenever. There was a newspaper story that I knew firsthand information about, whether it was about me or I knew the people. Mm -hmm. And you read the paper, and the, the story in the paper, and you go, wow, about, I don't know, 40 to 60% of the story is true of a story that you personally know firsthand, right? So you go, okay, well, that's probably true about every story in this paper, right? That this, mm -hmm. the, the bulk of, you know, like 40 to 60% is not accurate, right? And that's something that they wrote yesterday. Mm -hmm. So... You know, when you make a movie, you know, you're like, well, I wasn't there in the, you know, in the cell. No one, no one alive was there in the cell to know exactly what they said. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you go, okay, you know, and people say, well, was Thurgood Marshall that kind of person? Absolutely. He was a smart ass till he died. <laughs> you know, and... Um, and you know, you you talk to enough people who know the person. I mean, I've shown Marshall to a ton of folks who clerked under Thurgood Marshall, of course, his family, and they go, "Well, this is exactly who the guy was." Mm -hmm. There's no doubt you captured the man exactly. So you go, "Okay, so we made up the right stuff." Yeah. No, but it's again, it's just a, look. I always say when this argument comes up, and there are, I mean, you can't be, there, there you can't be casting someone from Ireland as somebody from India, right. right? But at the same time, can somebody show me Liam Neeson's German heritage? You know, it's like, the, we, we, ha we have to make decisions about who's the best actor to play the role, but be true to the overall of the story. You know, that's, that, that, that's for me is the balance of it. And, it and you've gotta be aware that the press the, the function of the press, as we know, that bad news is better than good news uh, in terms of selling papers, and they're going to look for what's wrong with any, any non-fiction film. They're going to start to say, the number one thing they're going to say is, this isn't true. Once you, we actually got sued for saying this is a true story within the name of the father. And they, the, the basic issues they had were like, well, Jerry Conlon wasn't in the same cell as his father, Giuseppe. No, he was next door. But we couldn't have them shouting through a wall in a film. you know. So we put them in the same cell. And the other, well, another big argument was that, oh, the British judges don't say, please approach the bench. Well, I don't give a fuck. They were, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but they were innocent, by the way. <laughs> did, did, did that happen to pass you by? Um, to, really quickly, before we enter the final phase of our conversation, which we can call the cutting room, um, I wanted to quickly ask you about the tone and the style of the two films. And, and again, you can answer this as well, because there's a very particular, you chose the style, as I said earlier, of a courtroom drama, buddy lawyer comedy. Mm -hmm. You chose- Can I just say one thing? Sorry. Yes. Sorry, if I said fat ass, I'm really sorry if I offended anyone here. I don't talk like that. I think it was just in the moment you were laughing and I just said something and I just feel terrible. I, I'm issuing I, a, gen I, a general I'm sorry. Irish, Irish apology. I, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. No, it's for, not the for same. The F word and anything else. It's That's not the <laughs> same, Terry. If you're it's offended by Angela's comment, there are bagels in the green room. We're happy to share <laughs> with you. She's such a jerk. Um, anyway, okay, go on. Alec. So I wanted to ask you about, it was a very peculiar choice of tone, both in Marshall mm -hmm. and in The Promise, which is a kind of like an old style. It's kind of the movie that was supposed to be made 80, 70 years ago, and it was never made, and was never made, and was never made, was never made. Maybe that's part of the, the choice. But I wanted to ask why you chose, because before, or adjacent to your choosing of the story, it's choosing the tone and style genre of the film. 
So if you could just comment upon the genre, the kind of doc you made, the kind of film you made about Marshall. Well, with Marshall, I, the main thing, I want to make a movie that you would like if you've never heard of Thurgood Marshall. Uh, I just said, can we just be a good legal thriller? And um, so a lot of it, you know, you, you watch a bunch of your favorite movies. Um, and so, you know, you watch To Kill a Mockingbird. And I mean, the, the legal movie that struck me the most was actually Inherit the Wind, uh, which if you haven't seen or, or you haven't seen in a long time, it's really worth looking at again. I mean, just visually, it's so extraordinary in the performances and the script. Uh, but I would tell you, but overall, the movie that really excited me was um, um, L.A. Confidential. Yeah. You know, you just go, oh, can we make that movie? I mean, that's a cool movie. Uh, and I don't know that we got there, but I mean, that, you know, it was a, a very different, you know, it was just a great noir thriller. And uh, noir is very dangerous because they didn't make money in the 50s. They don't make money now. So you go, oh, where are we? Are we driving this into a ditch? But uh, it, just, it just felt really right. So, you know, we stole from a lot of stuff. And, and again, um, the interplay, um, obviously there's a tradition of black, white, buddy movies, right? It goes back to the defiant ones. Um, and I really wanted to explore that because a big part of the movie is Thurgood realizing he doesn't have to do everything himself, right? That he can actually, you know, find the most unlikely person and turn him into a great civil rights uh, soldier. Um, so I said, well, that's an important dynamic. And that, because that leads to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and a lot of freedom fighting. Um, and I said, well, if you cast two actors who are essentially the same guy, then they're both kind of fighting for screen time. If they're two different people, then they will accommodate each other beautifully on screen, and they'll have a much better dynamic. And I knew Josh and Chadwick um, would do that for each other, and the interplay would be great. And I wanted, I mean, you know, obviously Sidney Poitier is sort of the template of these things, and Sidney Poitier as a brand is, I will maintain my dignity no matter what situation I'm put in. And, you know, and Denzel is kind of a different thing. He's actually what, you, even though you think of him like Sidney, he's actually more of a badass. So I said, you know, I want more of the badass because that's more true to who Thurgood Marshall was. And, you know, because Sam was so off his game, his first time trying a legal case, that he's the guy who's desperately trying to catch up. And the fact that there would be no cuteness, I mean, that the cuteness would all be earned. Mm -hmm. um, and that led to funny, because you know, life is funny. I mean, I think Goodfellas is one of the greatest comedies ever made. Um, and it's, you know, you shoot somebody, you go, now nah, you got to bury him. I mean, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, m movies about high stakes that are void of, I mean, it's gotta be pretty serious. I'm like, you know, the promise, yes, no jokes there. But I mean, you know, other than genocide, I, I kind of think there's room for a joke in most and movies. Django and Chain <laughs> was not. We, we did have a few jokes. We had, uh, <laughs> we had Marwan, the, the playboy who went, who was sent to medical school and he couldn't stand the smell of blood and See. fainted. And mm -hmm. you, you always, you always there's have always to have jokes. For, yeah. Like Jello, there's always room for yeah. a joke. <laughs> and and which you, the film you produced, uh, mm -hmm. Django Unchained, had more than a few jokes, mm -hmm. and a, certainly a different approach to violence than the one that Terry instructed uh, Oscar Isaac to take. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we, we were talking about that back there. Yeah. Could you describe the the kind of uh, the strategy when it came right. to violence in that film? Yeah. Well, well when Quentin and I first start talking about. It started with a conversation about movies about slavery, which I said I hate them all. Um, except for the one great movie about slavery, which is Spartacus. And I said, look, I'll, until you make a movie like that about the American experience, I'm not interested, right? And uh, so, he, you know, he said, I, I, you know, I agree with that. And I also referenced a movie, a black exploitation film, since that is one of his films. I said, look, when I was a kid, I saw this movie called The Legend of Nigger Charlie. You've all seen it, right? No. Um, it's on my Netflix queue. <laughs> and the, the Legend of Nigga Charlie, I actually don't remember a single frame of the movie. But all I remember is 
um, the star just kicked ass for two hours. And I left that movie feeling great. I was like, oh, that's what I'm talking about. That's cathartic release. So I said, can we make that movie? Can we have two? So I, I said, look, we have to have a formula. For every terrible thing that happens to a slave, twice as many bad things have to happen to the slavers. I said, we just have to, you know, a two to one ratio of just an enormous amount of ass kicking. So we were shooting the scene where Django finds the people, you know, who, you know, uh, you know beat him and sold his wife, uh, you know, onto another plantation. And uh, a, friend, uh, a, a friend of Sam Jackson's was in town that day. That's, oh, you, gotta, you came, a, came to set on a great day. Come on by. So <laughs> it's the scene where, you know, first Jamie shoots the first guy. Then he takes the whip, and he just beats the second guy. And he's beating him, and then his arm gets tired. He switches hands and beats him with the other. <laughs> and the guy who was watching says, can this movie come out tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, this, this is only 30 minutes in. There's more ass kicking to come. And so people go, oh, that's a really violent film. I'm like, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, and look, I think <clears throat> you have to make a lot of movies on a lot of different wavelengths to send a message. And, you know, there's a lot of films uh, about the Jewish Holocaust, and that's great because to, to understand every nuance of that horrible incident, you have to make documentaries, and you have to make a, a, a scripted films. You have to tell the story in every possible way. And then you have so many horrible things which the world will un go unnoticed unless you have great filmmakers like my friend here telling those stories one by one. Are you finally getting to tell the story of Rwanda or telling the story of the Armenian Genocide? I mean, these stories, I mean, one is not enough. You've got to tell it over and over. I mean, never forget is a, is a, is a message for everyone and all the horrors of humanity. So we got to tell it, and you got to tell it in every possible wavelength so the message gets through to the most amount of people possible. Since we are... <laughs> since we are writing a cheerful note, <laughs> let us change that by showing another clip. <laughs> one last clip, and this one, and it, it's, a pro, it's a fitting clip because it takes us into the dilemmas of the cutting room and also the, dilemma, the limitations of this medium. In, I, I will excite Terry's anger to quote uh, Stanley Kubrick, who said that Schindler's List, uh, that the, the Holocaust is about six million Jews who get killed, and Schindler's List is about 600 who don't. Um, and that is a criticism about the limits of the medium. Kubrick abandoned his Holocaust film project, mm. feeling he couldn't do justice to the, to the topic. And we can discuss that, of course, but no matter what, there are things that must be left out that it feels terrible to leave out. Uh, there are people who must, who are either forgotten or light, very lightly passed over. Um, one of them is, is uh, featured in this clip by, uh, uh, in Winter on Fire, which we're going to show. He, is, he does appear in the movie. You meet him in the movie. You mourn him in the movie. But he's one of so many faces that can't all be fit into the screen. Uh, my dearest in the booth, let us show the Winter on Fire clip. Рушевського слава важке було, коли я побачив, коли вони застрелили Нігаяна. Я общалась з Сережею Нігаяном. Мені дуже подобався цей парень, наскільки це світлий, красивий і відкритий чоловік. Художниця. Ось ця дівчина мене рисувала. Да, рисувала. Да, ось це. 
можна сказати, таких помислів від нього це не було. Я до вас давно хочу написати. Да? Да, тому що а я вас каждый... мене? Я кожен день вас віджу. Да? Хожу... Ми не знали, що з дому, ми не знали, що він куди їде. А потім він приїхав сюди і званий відсюди, що я на Майдан. Как бы мне в этой стране жить, не в другой же жить через месяц, там, через два месяца. Это мое будущее, то, что я здесь стою. Когда 22 января я открыла новости и прочитала, что этот парень погиб, ну, для меня просто казалось, что мир вообще рушится. Как можно так? Человек настолько светлый, у него вся жизнь была впереди. И как, как вообще могло произойти, что он погиб? Сережа просто взяла цей прапор, він носив у себе на грудях. Це була людина, ну, дуже велика людина, тому що він був великий вір... армянин, вірмянин і великий українець. Нам досі не вірити, ми чекаємо. От я тут, я думав, він там на Грушовському, наприклад. От таке відчуття. Не вірити. Всі єдині і всі за одного. Брат за брата, свій за свого. We have just a few minutes left and before opening it up for Evgeny and everyone else to comment on the cutting room and on, on uh, Sergei Nigoyan, I wanted to uh, state my uh, final thank yous to the Promise Institute, to everyone uh, who is part of it, to uh, the Skoll Center, to Peter Besans, to Dean Terry Shorts, to Chancellor Block, to Dr. Eric Israelian, uh, the surgical orchestrator of so much of this, and to Garin Hovanissian, the founder of Creative Armenia. Um, we were very thrilled to be part of this event, and we hope it's the first of many more to come and many other type of things to come. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the reception afterwards. Stay in your seats once we're done here because the Promise Institute Award will begin immediately and Mira Sorvino will be here to receive it. Um, I don't think that's a spoiler. Um, and uh, with a couple minutes left, I wanna leave it to our panelists to address what we just saw and uh, then fade into the backstage. Um. Uh, what you guys just saw is when I accomplished Pinto on Fire, I had uh, almost 12 terabytes of footage. And uh, Sergei, we met actually, it's even tough to watch because Sergei was the first person who was physically killed on Maidan. And he was Armenian who was with Ukrainian people on Maidan. And uh, he became a legend for everybody. As you saw, his image was even on the shields. He became this kind of inspiration for a lot of people. And uh, sometimes when you're cutting, his story is inside Winter on Fire, who saw Winter on Fire, we telling his story. But you know what? Uh, when I ended the movie, I did a certain segment on each and every person or in different sub subjects of my movie, because I felt that there is so much you want to tell additionally, and sometimes you're creating a short movies that just telling additional stories. It's sometimes not enough one hour and 50 minutes or one hour and 30 minutes to tell these incredible stories about these incredible people. That's why I have uh, some additional things and good stuff, you know. When we finished Winter on Fire, a lot of people came to me, like in your situations, when people come and say, oh, no, it's differently, or oh, you're missing these points. You know, I had uh, stories, the doctors were coming to me from Maidan saying, no, you know what, you, you, you left some stories about doctors out, 
Then out of Maidan came to me and said, you know what, you're not told a lot of stories about out of Maidan. Guys, I'm telling certain points of the history, but I can't put something that it was 93 days into an hour and 30 minutes. Same like it was tough to put six years of Syria in almost an hour and 50 minutes. So you're leaving something. And like Terry said, you need to take choices and make yourself to leave something, but keep the true story. So at the end of the day, we're making the decisions, what you're putting inside and what you're leaving outside. But sometimes, yes, it's painful. And then I creating these type of the small stories. The child that you saw at the beginning, who was very close to Romka, actually, who was close to Sergei, I did the whole 15 minutes short about him. So yeah. trying to keep it. A remarkable character, by the way. And the film is on Netflix. Um, we have to wrap it up now. I've been given the sign, and it's been waved, and I could hear uh, three silent amens to, I think, what Evgeny was just saying. Uh, thank you so much, Angela Serafian. Thank you so much, Terry George. Thank you so much, Reginald Hudlin and Evgeny Ivanovsky. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you to all, and stay in your seats. <laughs>